So a very warm welcome from my side. Um, I welcome you here to the Haus des Meeres, um, a very great and historic venue, not only with the view uh, across the modern Vienna, but also, of course, being a reminder of a much darker past uh, as uh, the building it was used for uh, decades ago. Um, my name is Lukas Ustela. I'm the director of NEOS Lab, the think tank and academy of uh, the Liberal Party NEOS. Uh, and I welcome you all, uh, not only here in the House of Meeres, but also in the live stream uh, and those who could not be with us due to the remarkable circumstances, not only in terms of uh, international politics, but also in terms of uh, pandemic management. Here in Vienna, we have a couple of thousand cases each day and some of you uh, are quarantined at home, but uh, I hope you find the event nevertheless interesting. And I'm very happy to have uh, a lot of you here today at the Haus des Meeres. We meet today under very remarkable circumstances. Uh, four weeks ago, Vladimir Putin launched a vicious attack on Ukraine, an attack that was expected by some, uh, but that still surprised many. Uh, the invasion of Ukraine by Russian forces has shaken the European continent, and we often hear the words Zeitenwende, uh, the sea changed, the new era that is uh, coming upon us. And we've heard it for the most tragic of reasons. We've heard it for uh, a war that is being waged only a few hundred kilometers uh, to our east, a war that has killed tens of thousands and displaced millions. As of today, I've looked at the statistic just uh, an hour ago, 3.9 uh, million people have fled Ukraine, according to uh, UNHCR. And it has been a war that has all also changed the attitude uh, in terms of foreign and security policy quite remarkably. The sea uh, changed, the Zeitenwende a quote uh, stems from Olaf Scholz three days after the invasion um, of Ukraine. Um, the war has also re uh, reignited the NATO ambitions of neutral countries um, to the north of Europe, like Finland. And it has also started a war that the West is willing to fight primarily with economic weapons. So sanctions uh, on banks, sanctions on individuals and sanctions for nearly everything but uh, Russian gas. It is my honor now to welcome Ivan Krastev uh, to our discussion, uh, the chair of the Center for Liberal Strategies and the fellow at the Institut on, on the Wissenschaft des Menschen in Vienna. He's a renowned expert on Eastern European politics, uh, a very um, uh, sought after commentator these days. Uh, thank you, uh, Ivan, for your time again. And to my right, uh, I welcome Bertemann Reisinger, party leader of uh, NEOS, and at least for me, uh, as important, the deputy president of the NEOS lab, um, uh, the liberal um, academy of NEOS. Uh, so just to kick off, uh, thanks for you both and a brief set of applause for you. Um, I have talked already about the Zeitenwende, and it is a quote that is being used for all different subjects, foreign policy, uh, security policy, economic policy. Uh, Ivan Krastev, four or five weeks into this war, what has really changed? Where do you see the Zeitenwende moments uh, and areas where we will see a Europe that looks at this point in history as a real changing point for its history? Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to be part of this conversation. There is a famous psychological experiment. In a very quick sequence, you're showing a person of drawings of cats, <laughs> and you're asking, what does he see? And he said, cats, cats, cats. And then you start, you start to change the drawing and mixing cats with dogs. And you continue asking what you're seeing, and the person continued to say that he sees cats because psychologically we're prepared to see what we have been used to see. And suddenly somebody is shouting the name of a person. So he's distracted. When he's back to the drawings, he starts to see the dogs. I do believe this is what is. many things have changed even before this war. Listen, there was the pandemic, there was the deglobalization, many supply chains have been distorted, but we were used to the world in which we have been living. And then comes the war, and from this point of view, war is 
probably the biggest kind of a shock we are prepared for, particularly in Europe, because we managed to convince ourselves that the major war in Europe is not possible anymore. So this is why when we're going to talk, and I'm going to touch on several policy areas, psychologically a lot has changed. Mm -hmm. It's not simply that something has changed in Ukraine. Suddenly, you start to see things that you have been seeing before very differently. And for me, this is important. And just give you one example. In 1920s, after the World War I, the Spanish flu came after the war. And probably, according to the historians, more people died because of the Spanish flu than during the World War I. But there are 80 times more books being written for the World War I than for the Spanish flu because there is a narrative, mm -hmm. because you start to understand what is going on. And now you have here the opposite. You have the pandemic, you have the feeling of unpredictable, you have the sense of catastrophe in the air. And then came this war. And Europeans start asking questions. What has changed? I'm just going to give you four things, which are very obvious. Germany. Germany has changed dramatically. Germany was famous for what? For very strong pacifist culture, which makes almost impossible, this was part of their identity, that they are not going to sell arms, that they are not going to rearm, they are not going to think in terms of war. And you have the Social Democratic Chancellor in a triple coalition with the Liberals and Greens, who basically comes with a 100 billion investment fund in the military. Secondly, what has changed dramatically is Sweden with one kind of a shot in Ukraine and Sweden neutrality was over. Now Sweden is supplying more weapons to Ukraine than most of the NATO countries. Mm. Just today the German Chancellor declared that basically Germany is going to respond and is ready to defend Sweden in the case of it's going to be attacked. Listen, this is also Sweden, this was part of the Swedish identity. And then go back to the refugee crisis of 2015, what everybody knew about Central and Eastern Europe that we don't like refugees. And now Poland has 2 million people on, in the country, 300,000 in Warsaw only. And people welcomed, they are living in the houses of the people. And now after Turkey, per capita, Poland is the country with the most migrants and refugees. Listen, these are dramatic changes. If we had this conversation just three months ago, these are the three things that you believe will not happen. And then go what's happened on the energy policy. Can you imagine that the European Commission has taken a decision in the period of one year to reduce the energy dependence of Russia basically with 75%? I don't know is it going to happen or not happen. This is a different story. and I do believe we should have a much more honest conversation. But on the level of how you're seeing the world, this has changed. And my last point is that also, the three major assumptions on which the European project have been built suddenly have been questioned in a big way. One is, we believe that military power has lost its importance in Europe. Not in the world. I don't believe that Europeans are so naive. But Europe never really, with the exception of France to some extent, never really invested in kind of a modern military because we saw also the fact that the Americans were so much overpowerful didn't help them in many places, the fact that others, and then suddenly you understand that you need to defend yourself. Secondly, economic interdependency. We believe that the more you're trading with Russia, the less is the risk that you're going to have a war. And suddenly you understand that you're trading quite a lot, but then it makes you very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And listen, and this is a dramatic thing. It's not just one politician making mistake, the other politician. It was a basic assumptions on which, in a certain way, European project was built. And the last is about moral foundations. One of the major story was that the whole of Europe, not only European Union, we shared a common understanding of the legacies of the World War II. And now it's not simply that you have Russia attacking Ukraine, but Russia is attacking Ukraine on the claim that it is there to denazify it, at the same time destroying basically the Ukrainian cities in the way they have been destroyed during the World War II by the Nazis. And this kind of a story is also destroying the narrative which we have been sharing. Mm -hmm. So for me, all this is a sea change. Mm -hmm. Now, the question also for you, Beate, if you look at those four to five weeks, uh, also in terms of what was being said about European politics, I mean, 
uh, Ivan Kastev touched a lot uh, on about German politics, the German Chancellor, but where do you see this Zeitenwende for the European project and also with its ramifications for, for us here in Vienna? Mm. Well, I, I, I must not uh, double what uh, Ivan Krastev said, but I, I think there's one more uh, thing I would like to add in a possible change of uh, politics that is the relationship between or the relation between the European Union and, uh, and the US. I mm -hmm. think that has changed, probably changed, we will see dramatically, because uh, um, not only under Trump, but also at the beginning of uh, Joe Biden's presidency, it was clear that the US will focus on uh, building a military partnership with Australia and, uh, and focusing on, on China and the Pacific and not focusing on Europe. So I think it, qu it is quite remarkable uh, what Biden said, although I hear what some people say now that he uh, went too far with his statement. In my opinion, he didn't do that, but he was very clear on the fact that the US does not give up on Europe. Mm -hmm. And the question is now, what, uh, what does that mean for the European Union? Because one thing that we uh, stress as, uh, as neos, as liberals, is that in Europe it is necessary to also focus on a sovereignty that is independent from the US and also in military means. That is a sovereignty not only focusing and relying on NATO, but also building like this hard power that is uh, crucial to have the power to, to put pressure on someone um, to go to the negotiation, uh, negotiation ta table, you know? Mm. And it also the same when it comes to foreign policy. There is no sovereignty when it comes to foreign policy. So I hope that this is now a turning po point um, also in European history that we will focus on the, let's see, maybe it's a little bit populistic when I say this, but um, important policy areas. I mean, mm -hmm. why do we need Europe for? Um, I must not be populistic to say that I sometimes got the impression that uh, when it comes to the really Big issues, big policy areas, climate change, refugees, um, security, whatever. The European Union was not a reliable protector or, a so or, or didn't bring the solution to the people, you know. And now maybe it's a, it's a change in policy that we focus on a, on a yeah, more common European policies when it comes to security, when it comes to defense policy, and also now a turning point, of course, in, <coughs> you said, the way we, say we saw trade in the past uh, years, uh, it's about also dependency from, yeah, autocracies. Um, and again, here I see a major shift in, in, in policy. I think that the European Commission is quite strong, von der Leyen now really uh, moves forward to <coughs> to give the impression that she is really um, uh, willing to go this extra mile here now to yes. focus on unity uh, of the European Union. So I think that's also dramatically changed because uh, f uh, half a year ago, I would say that she's not a very strong mm -hmm. <laughs> Commission president. Uh, now she 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 yeah she takes how do I say she uses her chance here. Mm. I would say. I mean, you, you touched the thing that clearly um, was important to all of us. Uh, Ivan Krastev also pointed that out. I mean, we have had these two years of um, the pandemic management and the economic policy surrounding this pandemic management behind us, and we all had the feeling of uh, this year will be uh, we will be focusing on all these future uh, pro uh, projects. Uh, this year at the European Commission is the year of the youth, for instance. Um, uh, this year we have projects on how we deal with demography for the long term, with education, and there is a new fund for digital investment uh, on Everything the European level. Good. Everything, Everything is, is important. important. But, you know, when it comes to security, yeah. like the first things first. Uh, exactly, I yeah. think people realize that. Yeah. I mean, uh, that is clearly uh, uh, a sea change because uh, if I remember properly the, uh, the events that were being taken place at the European Commission, for instance, in, uh, for the conference of, uh, for the future of Europe uh, in the last couple of months, many were focused on these very long-term issues and now we are focusing how to deal with energy over the next three quarters, how we deal with, uh, uh, with uh, security and defense for the next years. And, and the first reactions of the European member states, they were quite um, um, remarkably united. I mean, there is now a discussion that is very necessary, I think, to, to, to lead this discussion about a, a gas and an oil embargo. 
Um, but until this point, there was a remarkable unity in also the reaction of the European Union towards Russia. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make this the second round in a way. Um, we have heard um, quite often uh, also from, uh, for instance, uh, Timothy Garten Ash, the, uh, the view that one of the few things Putin established uh, and, and managed to do, uh, managed to accomplish in the last weeks of the war, in the first weeks of the war, was to un unite the West uh, when it comes to the policy response. Do you see that this is still kind of the point that um, w the, the liberal uh, Western economies and, and governments have united very strongly in terms of making uh, clear what is not up for grabs, uh, what uh, what is the line that Putin cannot cross and that the line that he already crossed will be punished quite harshly with sanctions and economic costs? Yes, and this is true, but also we should be quite realistic. Unity is not something that you can take for granted. Mm -hmm. And the easiest is to get the unity in the moment of shock. First of all, President Putin made two mistakes, which obviously uh, are very much affecting what we're seeing. One was very much with respect to Ukraine. He believed that there is no such a country. So from this point of view, he imagined his special operations. It was not meant to be a war as a repetition of what happened in Crimea. And he really managed to convince himself that Ukrainians and Russians are the same people and they're waiting for the Russian forces. You can see how they're waiting for the Russian forces. And this is, this is a reality on the ground and this is something that you can test. But the second is, I'm just going to give you an example of this. He believed that there are going to be Western response, there are going to be Western sanctions, and they can stop at best with SWIFT. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to give you a reason why probably this was the way the Russian side was thinking. Russia has been accumulating a lot of external currency reserve. This was basically their way to prepare for the moment of uh, uh, sanctions. The only problem is that they kept these currency reserves in dollars and when they decided to diversify it from dollars, they put it in euro. As a result of it, out of the 600 billion dollars that Russian state has basically saved for this time, 400 million is in the European and American banks and it was frozen. If you believe that your, your central bank is going to be sanctioned, you're not going to put this money in American and European banks. So from this point of view, it was Ukraine, but then our response. Uh, our response was possible also because our societies reacted to the extent I believe many politicians did not expect. In solidarity. Was Listen, there was a moral outrage. And in a places that you were going to be surprised to see, just give you an example. Do you know, according to the opinion polls, which is the most pro-Ukrainian society in Europe today? Spain. If it was Polish, <laughs> you easily can explain. <laughs> the problem is that you have 84% of the Spaniards who said that they stand firmly behind Ukraine. They want Ukraine to be armed. They want, and the story is why. First, Spain never was particularly anti-Russian on the level of geography, far away. And I do believe that here suddenly what uh, President Putin didn't realize is that he unlocked fears and very different remembrance of the European societies. I can imagine that in Catalonia, they identify with the Ukraine not for the same reasons that in Madrid. Uh, but for all of them, it also reminds them of Spain in 1936. It reminds them of the way that something is dramatically changing. And when you have the public opinions basically aligning for the politicians was much easier. The biggest problem, and this is really, it's easier to be commentator than a political leader in this world. Uh, because three things are going to change with uh, the passing of time. One is, and we know from previous crises, the first reaction of people is massive solidarity shock, but then people want to go back to normal. They're exhausted. They cannot stay with this. I cannot watch the war anymore. And particularly if you're going to see certain type of a frozen conflict type of a development somewhere in the beginning of the summer, people try normally to forget the awful things that are happening around them. So the pressure on politicians are not going to be the same. 
Secondly, economic sanctions are hurting Russia. They're going to hurt us too. And by the way, this is part of the sanctions. In a certain way, the strength of the country is not to show what you can do to others, but to show that you have the capacity to endure pain. Because this is a kind of a, this is in fact what it is about. But then suddenly you have a conversation talking also about Germany. To say that you're going to reduce so dramatically uh, the dependence on the Russian gas and oil, and particularly gas is what really matters, it means that Germany can end up in the next winter with rationing electricity. Listen, this is Germany, it's not Bulgaria. <laughs> so people have a certain expectations about what is a comfortable life and so on and so on. And then it's very important where the society is going to stand on this. Certainly, and in my view, this is also something, uh, part of the expectations on the Russian side, why they believe that they can do this, and we are not going to overreact, is that they managed to convince themselves, and it's up to us to prove that they were wrong, that in the consumer societies, people are not ready to sacrifice. People can get kind of outraged for a while, but then they are going to insist to go back to normality, while basically President Putin has the instruments to make Russian society sacrifice, even if they don't want to. Uh, uh, and from this point of view, this is going to be a major challenge for the democratic societies because it's a totally different game. Mm -hmm. Before you were saying we're living better than you. And now you should convince that we like, we are ready to stay. Mm -hmm. And we are ready to do this. And this is happening in society in which governments do not have the feeling anymore that they have the right to ask their societies for sacrifices. Just give you one example. In the period between 1984 and 1991, no American president has been using the word sacrifice in their speeches. It was over. Mm -hmm. Kennedy was asking people to sacrifice. The war generation, it was there. And then the idea was we're beyond this. Mm -hmm. Imagine what is, if it is in the United States, it changed with 9-11 in their case. But this is what we're talking about. And then the unity is going to depend on very much where society stands. It's not enough the governments to ally. So in my view also governments are trying to use this momentum of a unity of the opinions. This is why I do believe that the German Chancellor was right on the timing. If he has not done what he did on the third day of the war, he probably cannot do the same on the hungry day of the war. But this is also true for uh, uh, gas and oil embargo. Totally. If you don't do it in the totally. first weeks, in order to get as much pressure as possible on Putin, you will never do it. Uh, particularly with uh, oil, this is very interesting because the oil is not sanctioned, but the market expected it to be sanctioned. Yeah. So the prices go up. Uh, prices are very high, but because it is not sanctioned, every day, uh, Russian uh, state gets around one billion dollars mm. from the purchases being done in Europe and the United States. So this is quite interesting and one of the interesting arguments that I uh, heard from uh, Vice Chancellor Habeck was the following. He said, we should start particularly sanctioning oil, uh, but we are going to also to make clear to the Russians that if they're going to stop hostilities, we can lift this one. Because the basic problem with the sanctions on the other side, it, it is very easy to be imposed and very difficult to be lifted. And this is particularly true for the American sanctions. First, I cannot see President Biden being very much interested to lift any sanctions while Putin is in yes. power. But even if he decides, I cannot see American Congress allowing this to happen. Because the, the sanctions on Russia does not have a major economic impact on the United States. But then again, there would be a case being made, as you just pointed out, on conditional sanctions, right? Yeah. So we, shank, we sanction, for instance, the, uh, the exports of oil for the specific amount of time that Putin still wages the yeah. war in Ukraine. No, no, this is very, listen, and also, uh, because for me this is important, at, at some point, and this will start now, it will be very important point in the Russian propaganda, is going to be, in my view, important point on the Chinese side. Because of our sanctions, but also mostly because of the war, you're going to see serious type of crisis which is going to affect everybody, not just us. The prices of oil are the prices for everybody the prices of food is going to change dramatically. Don't forget that Russia and Ukraine are the two biggest exporters of grain in the world. 
uh, we are talking about big exporters of fertilizers. So suddenly countries like Egypt, which depended to 70% of their uh, imports of uh, uh, grain from places like Russia and Ukraine, they're going to have a massive increase of prices. And then the problem is whom they're going to blame. And this is why kind of the fight, because the West is united. Non-Western world condemned Russia, but they didn't join our sanctions. Even big countries like India and so on that you expect. So this is going to be also a very difficult period to try to convince others that the more they're tolerating this regime, basically the longer the war will go. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is not going to be easy. My feeling is that the easiest period is over. Uh, basically, Putin made a strategic miscalculation. Europe reacted in the way that he didn't expect it. For the US, probably, he was more prepared that they'll go uh, 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 far. Nevertheless, even on the US, because he, he rightly knew uh, that President Biden wanted to focus on China and he wanted to get out of uh, Europe. So basically, he believed that this is why the Americans will not try to be interested to come very much here. But the next, in my view, hungry days are going to be the most important for European Union. Paradoxically, it's not the first hungry, but the second hungry days that are going to decide are we going to make it, where we're going to shape it, where our publics are going to stand, and how much risk our politicians are ready to take. Re regarding the politicians, Berta, you've been uh, traveling uh, quite a lot in the last couple of uh, days and weeks. You've met Vestager, uh, for instance. Before I got uh, sick with COVID and yeah, I'm but actually recovered. Yeah, but bef before that, you already started also to, within uh, the other parties, within uh, various governments in Europe, uh, to, to also look at into the views of various governments, various countries. Do you see, do you sense the solidarity moment in this uh, time of, of shock uh, in, uh, that uh, Ivan Kaster pointed out? Well, first I see shock. Mm -hmm. And th this is the first emotion I see every, I saw everywhere. That's shock. It's th th exactly like, yeah, like you said. How is this even possible? Even those who, who were uh, like uh, 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 talking about he, uh, Putin might in make an invasion, they were shocked. So everybody is shocked. The second thing is I think there are three groups in Europe. One group is not reliable on Russian gas and oil. Mm -hmm. So they're very much pushing forward and put putting as much pressure as possible. Or let me, s let me begin otherwise. What is really remarkable is that the Ukrainian narrative that uh, Zelensky built up, it's in a way David against Goliath, whatever, and protect our freedom, protect our, f our Western society, protect Europe. We, we are fighting for Europe. That is working in a way that no one would ever have uh, expected. Mm. Even in the US, Trump said he, he admires what Putin did, but I heard, uh, I don't remember the, the exact numbers, but uh, that even under Trump voters, there is a remarkable high um, uh, like rate uh, uh, in, in favor of uh, Zelensky and, uh, and uh, the Ukraine. So this narrative is really, really working and it's unifying in a way because um, we accept or we, we, we say the Ukraine, Ukrainian people, they are fighting for our values here. And if, it's, 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 if, if we don't win this war, if we don't win this war, then we will have Russia at our borders. So this is working. So, but there, I think there are three groups in Europe. One is not uh, economically and uh, energy-wise uh, reliable on Russian gas and oil. So they say keep up the pressure now. Uh, let's hit Putin very hard in order to get him on the negotiation table and stop the killing. Then there is a group, um, Austria, Germany, Netherlands, that is very much uh, um, um, Hungary, uh, um, uh, unfortunately dependent on Russian uh, gas and oil, and they are like blocking this. And then there is a group that is also dependent on Russian oil and gas, but they know about the Russians <laughs> because of their history. That's the Baltic states, for example, and they say, let's stop them here because uh, we're the next. Pol Poland, I, I think as well, there's the, the talk about the corridor. I, I know there's another thing to really attack a na NATO country, but you know, it's so much within the deep, deep narrative of these countries that they say, we have to do, we have to do everything, even take sacrifices, we have to stop Putin now because we don't want to have a border like directly to, to Russia. Yeah, and I think this discussion is, is uh, now going on and I, I'm, I'm, I totally agree. I think that the next uh, 100 days are 
more difficult than the first one. It also depends on what what is going on now with the talks, uh, with the negotiations, peace talk, whatever. Um, and if Putin really uh, withdraws his troops from Kiev, for example, what also is different to other conflicts we we've seen in the past is that we like get uh, videos, photos, um, eyewitness statements of uh, uh, war crimes in like in real time through social media in a way that we never got before. And this is also like a pressure point. I mean, the, the I know there is a red line drawn. I must say there is a red line. It's not a legal red line, but it is drawn not to deliver lethal weapons, but only to deliver weapons that uh, are used for self-defense or whatever. But I'm not sure what will, what will like for example, this the theater in Mariupol. You saw a theater, you can have the pictures, then you see what it's like now. And you saw even that the word children is written was written on the ground. And now there is a news that 300 people, I including children, were killed uh, in the theater. So this is putting a lot of pressure also on, on the European Union and on mm. the West. And from this point of view, Germany is interesting. Because Germany, like uh, Austria, is very much dependent on particularly Russian gas. It's 40% of their basic energy mix. At the same time, German public opinion, which is very strongly moralistic public opinion, is supporting, basically sanctioning. This can change, but this is also putting politicians in a different position when you see basically your public being outraged. And from this point of view, I very much agree with Beat. Zelensky effect is something to be taken very seriously. Listen, before the war started, he was with support around 20-25%. People were disappointed economically, like most of the countries. Uh, Ukraine was in a difficult position. But then you understand that politicians are judged on the moment of the highest risk. And he stayed for the moment. And as a result of it, two things happened. First, for the first time against President Putin, there is not a general abstract idea. There is a young man of a different generation ready to take risk. One is sitting in a 20 meters difference uh, on the table from his uh, defense minister. The other, against the advice of every single Western intelligence agency, said, I'm going to stay in Kiev. And listen, this kind of a possibility to take risk and to sacrifice is changing the perceptions of the people totally. Mm -hmm. Now he has a 90% support within Ukraine, but exactly what Beata is saying, Americans, Europeans. You have a different type of a leadership. There are people who are ready to risk something. And in my view, this is also what is different. It's person against person. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a, a friend who is a very famous uh, artist uh, in Moody's. And talking about the refugee flows, he basically made a, a kind of comment and insight that I also find totally uh, fascinating. He said, this is the first time that we see the exodus of people who are living with their pets cats and dogs. And he said, you cannot imagine how strong is the psychological impact of this. Because suddenly you say, this could be me. It's, it's totally true because I, I was in the Ukraine and I was at the border. And one thing I reported was remarkable yeah. for me that everybody was carrying a cat or a dog. Well, one, one, only yeah. one small bag, yeah. backpack, yeah. and a cat. Uh, and listen, when you see this, and this on visual level, so this person is not interested in sociological analysis. He said, there are three things that you see. Paradoxically, the cats and dogs are humanizing mm -hmm. very much because you have people who are just running of their house in the way you're running out of fire. Uh, you're not going to say these people are economic migrants. It's not a labor migrants. You can see people running from a war. Of course, most of them being women and children because of uh, the men had to stay and to fight. But suddenly, most of the people who are watching this on television, they have their cats next to them. And in my view, this is also this type of a small things, images uh, so strongly affect the way people react. And I do believe this is also certain things like with these videos. It is one thing to be told how many people have been killed and what is happening with the theater. It's one thing to see it on television. It's totally different to see it on your telephone, knowing that it was not done by the professional journalist, but by somebody who is there. And in my view, this is also kind of a totally economic sanctions and information wars. 
he had reached the level which is in my view unprecedented for anything else plus for the europeans this is destruction of cities that many europeans has visited Listen, Aleppo was a major tragedy, so destruction of Aleppo was awful, but not many Europeans have been in Aleppo. There was many people that have been in Kiev. And this is changing very much. I have been there, I was on this street. It's only a couple of hundred kilo kilometers to the east, yeah. I mean, in a way, you, you, you both are saying something that uh, reminds me of a um, of an more uh, an economic uh, um, sentence and quote, namely, um, we are all Ukrainians now. Um, we are all Keynesians now. Was the sentence of economists uh, after uh, the Great Depression and uh, uh, the, the work of John Maynard Keynes? But we are all Ukrainians now in terms of how we approach the, the moral side of this um, uh, fight against uh, Putin's aggressionism. Uh, might be a quite um, a fitting argument here. Now, w what I find, I mean. There has been commentary uh, in the last, in the first couple of days after this war, um, suggesting that Putin already lost the war. You've also been confronted with this by Armin Wolf in the Tip uh, interview a couple of weeks back. I would like to reflect on 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 this question with you. Uh, do you think that this is the beginning of the end of Vladimir Putin's reign in Russia? Listen, I'm very much afraid of this type of questions because quite a lot it could be a self uh, kind of a congratulating stories. Of course he lost the war that he believes he wanted to start. This is not his war. His was not a war, it was a special operation. And he had to be over today. Uh, at the same time, I do believe we should try to understand that it is not over in many respects. Uh, it is one thing for President Biden to go and to say the guy must go. It's totally different for the guy to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and talking about regime change is one thing. Having regime change is a totally different thing. For the moment, unfortunately, uh, Russian population, because of the total media control, but because of many other things that probably we should discuss, not now, but it should be discussed in Europe, are mobilized under the idea that the world is against Russia, that Russia is not fighting Ukraine, but they're fighting uh, United States and so on. Uh, the level of repression of the regime in Russia has changed for the last four weeks to the extent that you cannot imagine. People that have been visiting Russia even three months ago, which was quite a repressive state anyway, cannot imagine how different it is today. Listen, just going with no to war, which is, it was everywhere you risk to be put in prison for 15 years. So when we are also blaming the Russians for not going in millions on the street, and by the way, 1.8 million Russians signed an anti-war petitions, keep in mind that these people really risk getting 15 years in prison. How many of us will do it? Uh, because I, I hear a lot of people basically kind of easily more, it's very tough. And it happened to a society that has a very strong memory of repression and it kind of unlocked fears that were almost there. But as a result of it, he's going to stay at least for the while. Probably they could be palisco, it could be everything. We cannot predict this. Mm -hmm. So in a certain way, we cannot live with the idea that in six months he'll go. Uh, you cannot base your policies on this. Secondly, you cannot base your policy on the idea that even if the hostility is going to stop, you can go back to normal. You cannot call somebody a war criminal and just to believe that the next day everything is going to be like it was before, because then this is totally demoralizing for society. You simply cannot do it for yeah, yourself, that's because that's of yourself. Yes. Obama had the problem yeah, with for Syria. Exactly. You, you see, it's, it's not, you, you cannot do it. Yeah. Uh, like you cannot uh, do it. And to be honest, all the Ukrainians who are going to be in our cities, they're not going to allow this to happen. Yes. Because for these people, this is not a talk. Their houses, their lives have been totally changed. And I do believe this is also the story. We do not have for the moment a European strategy, how we're going to deal with Russia, which even if the war is going to stop, is going to be a Russia that is going to be hostile. Of course, you can uh, normalize some of the trade relations, but we don't have an idea how we want to change Russia beyond the abstract idea of the regime change. And this is, uh, this is in my view, one of the weak points of uh, European strategy. And of course, the metaphor of the Cold War is a yeah. nice metaphor, but you know, Cold War has a different phases. We remember the nice part. <laughs> late 1980s when the Cold War was going out. 
but there was a Cold War also in the late 1940s and early 1950s, and it was a very aggressive type of a confrontation. It was very much everybody trying to undermine each other. This was a lot of much more violence, and even in this city, basically, it was experienced very differently. So uh, th there is need for politicians really to make their mind how they imagine coexisting with type of regime that uh, was declared criminal. Mm -hmm. But that's exactly what I wanted to say in my first statement, that I think that it's really, and of course you're totally right if you say like the metaphor, this is a new Cold War, then you won't get to, yeah. to any solution. Um, Europe must wake up also when it comes to like, not we don't, we not only have no strategy, we have no capacity of building a strategy at the moment. Yeah. And this is what I think is, is crucial here, to build up the capacity, and this is also an institutional discussion uh, uh, necessary, to have the capacity of a strategy towards Russia. And of course, this strategy has to be independent from the US. I totally agree. But you know, I'm, I talked to Karel Schwarzenberg lately, which was really an honor, and he is, he is convinced that this is the end of Putin. And he's even more convinced that this is the end of Russia, the way we look at it, because he says like China is waiting and it's only a, a question when, of if it's uh, two years or 50 years, he doesn't know, but he knows for sure that China is uh, already there waiting. Now listen, but when is an important question? Because <laughs> for sure, Mr. Putin is human and humans are mortal, uh, but it makes a difference. <coughs> of course. Is when is in one year or in 25 years? <laughs> Of no, no, this was in relation to the question if uh, China is going to claim like yeah. uh, no, no, having a bigger yeah, exactly. stake exactly. in Russia. No, listen, Russia lost many things and one is totally their balance of the relations with China. They so much insisted that they didn't want to be a junior partner of the United States during the early part of the post-Cold War period. I don't believe that the Russians are going to be particularly happy to realize how much dependent on China they're going to be on everything, technology, finance, and things like this in this kind of a polarized world. Particularly, and for me this is important, one of the things that was very much moving President Putin, because I have been following his statements uh, for a longer period of time, in the last several months before the war, without being asked by anybody, in totally different meetings with students, uh, with political leaders, he was complaining about the demographic decline of Russia. He was saying, well, if it was not for the revolution, if it was not for the disintegration of Soviet Union, there are going to be 500 million Russians in the world today. And the idea that you have a country which is extremely big in space, imagine also global ch uh, warming is going to enlarge Russia. 65% of the territory of Russia is a frozen land. Mm. Part of it will start to unfreeze. And then you don't have people. And I do believe this idea to grasp and to get the Ukrainians, Belarusians, to consolidate what he believed is the demographic body of historic Russia was one of the arguments. Because when you start to think in demographic terms, mm -hmm. this is becoming critically important. And then, of course, comes the relations with China. And this is not easy for him. And particularly, it's not going to be easy the one that comes after him. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so... Uh, Karen Schwarzenberg knows what he's talking about. The problem is when. <laughs> but, do, but do you see, nevertheless, I mean, you, you mentioned before uh, the late era of the Cold War, uh, a period where we had two very distinct blocks uh, in terms of countries globally, the, we the Western liberal democracies on the one side and uh, communism on the other side. Now we have more of a West uh, and liberal and authoritarian uh, divide globally. Do you see that this... Zeitenwende, uh, this, uh, this turning point is also happening in terms of whether there will be cooperation between those two blocks or just going forward more within those two, so that for instance Russia will start leaning especially hard uh, towards China, towards other authoritarian regimes in terms of trade, in terms of economic policy, in terms of cooperation, and that we will see a kind of a revival of West versus um, authoritarian regimes? First of all, Russia does not have any other options than to rely on China. If you're a Russian leader and you're under Western sanctions, to whom you're going to rely on Mongolia? Uh, so from this point of view, they're going to move for sure, but it's much more important. Russia tries to present this conflict, not as conflict between democracy and authoritarian regimes, but between the West and the rest. 
in the Russian narrative, this is the last grasp of the Western powers to keep their hegemonic power in the world. And this is why Russia is trying to do their best to attract on their side even non-Western democracies like India and others. Mm -hmm. So from this point of view, there are going to be clash of narratives. Our narrative, democracies versus authoritarianism, should not be taken immediately to, to be the prevailing one, because the idea that the West is trying to uh, basically respond to its declining importance in the post-Western world is something that others are easily buying. Uh, the other story about how this uh, thing are going to work. American elections in 2024 are going to be very important. And this is what Beate said, listen, paradoxically, the division in the United States is such that every election now there looks like a regime change. You can have a different foreign policy, different foreign policy priorities, but one thing is sure. If you're a technology company today, you start to realize that you, it's impossible for you to be equally successful on the Western and on the uh, Chinese market. You should make a choice. You know that at some point you're going to see decoupling because securitization, particularly of the technology sectors, went so far on both sides mm -hmm. that this kind of a decoupling is not just ideological differences, but it's a different standards, different regimes. So for businesses and particularly for global businesses, everything is changing and you can see it in Russia. For example, uh, when uh, the sanctions came, there were many companies that were not in the sectors that have been sanctioned. But then they look around, some of them depended very much on the mass customers. And they said, if I'm going to stay in Russia, I'm going to have a reputation risk, better to leave. But the moment when you're leaving, the Russian government said, every Western company who is leaving because of war and because of sanctions, we are going to treat this as a forced bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. So they're starting to sue these companies. And by the way, some of the people which will see also is Russian passports, they really risk being put in prison. So in a certain way, before you believe that you're a global company, and then the war comes and you have a national passport, you're Austrian company or American company, and you're going to be treated very much according to your passport. Listen, this is a different world. Yesterday's the big companies didn't believe that they have a national passports. Mm -hmm. And now they have. For instance, for, this is true for the Russian companies <laughs> operating outside of Russia. For instance, there was a very interesting interview with uh, the CEO of RHI, uh, Feuerfest uh, company, uh, in the press today uh, or yesterday, where he also stressed the point that due to sanctions, he just doesn't know whether the millions of euros uh, that um, people owe him in Russia will ever be repaid or whether he has actually no real legal title on the money that he's legally owned. So you should work with the assumptions that the money are not going to be repaid. Um, we will or in rubles. Yeah. So that is not really the no, money. No, this was the decision about. of the Russian government. All the things are going to be repaid in rubles. Um, now, I would like to, to um, briefly, before um, opening the questions, I've already received some uh, via, uh, via social media. Um, touch on the, on the subject of um, the order within uh, Europe, uh, common foreign policy, common defense policy, uh, and especially um, because it's an interesting uh, debate, of course, also in Austria, how we deal with uh, our state of uh, neutrality uh, uh, in, in Austria, but also how this has changed in uh, the northern parts of Europe. Um, even Gastaf, you have pointed out that um, the view on, on this issue has shifted uh, significantly in Sweden. Um, do you see that going forward we will see something like this um, self-sustained European defense cap capacity being kind of rivaled to what we consider nowadays as relevant, namely NATO capacity. Today, everybody's talking about NATO when it comes to uh, um, oh, defense capa uh, capacity. Do you see that Europe, uh, the co a common European army, might be uh, taking this place uh, a couple of years down the road? The biggest co question about common European army is who is going to command? 
<laughs> no, th th this is the problem of sovereignty. Who basically decides where the military forces will go? And from this point of view, of course, Europe can increase its military budgets and others. But to compare this what, with what Americans have is going to be, in my view, totally unrealistic because you need decade of major investment, but also cultural changes. It's not simply to put the money. By the way, you can see this even in Ukraine. Uh, one of the major kind of uh, problems in Ukraine is that not simply you should arm the Ukrainians, but you should arm them with the weapons that they know. So it's not by accident that the former East European countries are the ones being pushed and asked to give uh, weapons because this is the old Soviet weapons because the Ukrainian army very well knows how to basically deal with them and as you see they are dealing uh, very successfully but for example to use the Patriot system you need six months American trainers around and so on and so on so from this point of view it's one thing to talk about the army but try to imagine now we're talking about 5,000 uh, rapid uh, uh, defense force which is good to have it because it allows you to act in a certain places where the Americans are not interested to act so this is very important but to believe that as a result of it we're going to have a military capacities comparing with the Americans Chinese or even Russians this is not serious so by the way countries like Finland and uh, Sweden has put much more thinking about their defenses and basically their armies than most of the big European states, probably with the exception of, uh, uh, of France. And then on neutrality, I, uh, as you know, uh, I don't speak German, so on Austria I cannot comment at all. But there is one thing that uh, neutrality has changed very much uh, since the period of the Cold War. Switzerland decided to basically endorse and to join the financial sanctions against Russia. Do you believe that Russians perceive them as neutral? Do really, basically, Austrians believe that seen from Kremlin by joining the sanctions, which is economic war, Austria is perceived as a neutral I country? I fear that the Austrians really believe we're neutral in this uh, area. Um, they, um, Do you know what is the problem with neutrality? <laughs> uh, others also should believe it. Yeah. Uh, no, and this is very. Uh, Austria is part of the European Union. Of European course. Union has common defense and security policy. Of course, Austria is not member of NATO, so many policies is different. But to believe that Austrian neutrality is the same as it was no Austrian neutrality in the 1980s, uh, in my view, probably is good for the spirit of the people, uh, but it is not how it is seen from outside. At least this is my view. Otherwise, where? You're, you're right, it's also legally not, not the same as in the 1980s because when we joined the European Union and uh, we also s uh, changed our constitution uh, regarding the, the common security and defense p uh, policy, including the Petersburg uh, uh, Aufgaben and everything. So, I mean, uh, the only thing that we have is uh, really focused on the, on the, we are not delivering weapons. But we're delivering, li delivering like um, helmets. helmets, or you say caskets mm -hmm. and and vests for civil use only. Of course, I mean it's really necessary. Um, and uh, of course, we 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 have no NATO troops in Austria stationed. This is the core of neutrality in Austria. But apart from that, we are not neutral, not in this conflict. Uh, uh, no, no, I agree, and I can imagine that. By the way, this is interesting to see. You have a NATO member state like Turkey which is not part of the sanctions, at the same time, they're basically providing Ukrainians with the most kind of lethal weapons, the famous Bayraktar's drones and so on. So from this point of view, in my view, the very idea of neutrality and the way it was defined uh, after the end of the World War II and the Cold War is changing. And it is changing exactly because of the interdependence and because of the importance of the economic dimension of war. Yeah, but you know, the neutrality in Austria was also um, always a little bit like... Um a protecting shield when it comes to doing business with Russia. So we are neutral in a way, and that's why we, we were really fine in doing business with Russia and um, inviting Putin several times here and uh, like taking part in this whole appeasement thing. And there was just this really embarrassing article in the Financial Times about uh, mm. Austria being a must carrier for uh, Russian spies, a, a carrier aircraft for Russian spies. So like we have an issue here. We, we are not... Even in the last sanctions took place, um, uh, Dr. Kressley yesterday told us that it was in Austria that companies were established in order to um, flow around the sanctions uh, for, for, for Russian companies. You're not so, so exceptional with kind of the risk to hurt 
Austrian pride. Uh, I can tell you that Cyprus was doing this, even Latvia that is not famous for being pro-Russian. There was a period in which you can benefit from the certain type of things, but that's not the case anymore. And what it means to be basically neutral, you can ask the Raiffeisen people, where basically their business in Russia is put under pressure and so on. So from this point of view, it's quite important to realize that it's a different reality. So from this point, it doesn't matter what basically Austria is going to decide. It's simply a different game because economic war is going on and Austria is part of it. And even on the level of weddings where uh, 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 Austria has been overperformed, uh, the story is that most of the people are sanctioned. They cannot come to the country. Yeah. So you should basically then somewhere else. Um, you, 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 meant, uh, you both mentioned uh, a thing that I would just uh, like to, to raise awareness of. Um, we, we just looked at the, the in, uh, interdependence in trade and, and capital stocks in, in Austria vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, Russia, Belarus and, and many other uh, uh, regimes and more authoritarian uh, countries. And we just uh, made also an international comparison here that clearly showed that Austria has... Uh, very significant presence, uh, apart from Cyprus, of course, uh, the biggest uh, uh, presence uh, of, of Russian capital uh, within within Europe, within the euro area, and thus, of course, also an importance when it comes to how functioning, how effective will be the sanctions on people who are holding capital within the European uh, uh, union uh, from Russia, because that is clearly also a way of putting pressure on the more inner circle uh, surrounding uh, Putin and the oligarchy. Listen, uh, in my view, and here I could be very much wrong, but in moments like this is also very important to make a distinctions. Not every Russian is a Putin supporter. Of course. Many people are in Europe because they don't want to be in Russia. And not just in the last six weeks, but basically there was a pressure on people. And here comes the government, because if basically European governments decide to go against anybody with the Russian passport, we are losing also post-Putin Russia. Yeah. But at the same time, there are people who basically made their money because of their position uh, in the Russian regime. They hide their money here, they enjoy this, and making distinctions between one and the other, in my view, is one of the most important things. Mm -hmm. Trying to see that basically Austrian intelligence service Austrian governments, Austrian people are making distinctions between these people. Uh, because otherwise, uh, this is not going to be effective. Either you're basically going against nobody, saying all oh, these people are just here and there, or you're going to try to hurt people who basically are going to yeah. risk. But as it is based on common European decisions here, I think there is no fear that uh, Austria will go after every Russian. I mean, I think that's a commission and there they have this like really, uh, I think it's not the intelligence services of Austria delivering some information about Russian oligarchs, but more UK and probably, I don't know, other, other countries. But they are delivering like really info who is financing what in Russia and who is related yeah. to really the inner circle of Putin. And they are on the sanction list. Some are not, as we discussed already in Austria. Um, and th they are, uh, so like it's a common decision to go after them, but not o o every Russian, of course. No? No, but yeah, I am even not talking only about Austria. I do believe this is very important because there are two things. One is they're really not simply that these people have their money here, but this money can be weaponized at some point. This money will start to buy influence, this money are going to start to basically try to influence decision making. So in this situation, this money also instruments. Yeah. On the other side, as we talked before, President Putin, who is in a great uh, shape and physically very strong, as we can see in the videos that are shown, uh, this is not forever. And from this point of view, to try to imagine that Russia always should be in the way it is now, in my view, also should be kind of failure of our imagination. In the way in 1990s, we believed that there is no way that Russia was the only option is to become democratic. I had the feeling that now many people decided that there is no any other option but Russia basically to be what it is now. So history is slightly more surprising. Another Russia probably is also possible. It's not going to be like Austria. Uh, but it does not mean to be a country that attacks any kind of its neighbors and basically tries to reject the sovereignty of the people around. And this is why making these distinctions, mm -hmm. allowing Russians to have a serious conversations about their own future, which is not something that has taken place in the last two decades, in my view, is very important. But how can we do that? Because, I mean, it was a hard decision on blocking Russia today. I think it's really not an easy decision to take. But how is there any way that we can keep up a dialogue 
now, especially now, and especially in, in an area where you have blocked Facebook, Twitter, all Western media, you don't get information to the Russian people and there is no open uh, Discourse. In I can imagine that there are probably hundred thousand or two hundred thousand Russians here in Austria. It's a different views. Some of these people probably hate Putin much more than any of the Austrians because he destroyed their country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These people are going to talk to the Russians. It's not going to be up to foreigners to tell the Russians how basically to redesign their society and probably they're not going to come exactly with the position on which we are. But in my view, taking seriously the fact that there are differences within the Russian society too, we cannot see much of them. By the way, people who are here is also the best way for us to know what is happening in Russia because with all this kind of a closing, no possibility to travel, no possibility to go through internet and others, we also don't have a clue what is going on. And I'm not talking about the intelligence information. I'm talking about how people feel, what they believe is happening. But their relatives who are living here, uh, people with whom you discuss, and one of the most heartbreaking things that I'm t uh, listening to and being told about the war in Ukraine, the last thing that I talked, two sisters, both of them from Mariupol. One is living in Moscow, the other in Kiev. They have the house of their grandmother uh, in Mariupol that was destroyed. For the one month, they don't talk to each other because the one in Moscow believes that the one in Kiev is a Nazi and the other in Kiev believes, in my view, is much more legitimacy that the one in Moscow and what the Russians are doing is a distraction like the Germans in the World War II. Listen, this is such a dividing and it is going to be so strong. And by the way, what Putin did to the Russian culture and Russian language, some of these people are not going to want to study Russian on the Ukrainians because this was their first language. This is things that we're going to see with years to come. And I do believe also on this, uh, one of the things that we should also, in my view, we all to everybody is to be curious what is happening to these places. Even if you have an iron curtain, even during the iron curtain, and I'm Bulgarian, I have been on the other side. Uh, one of the important things that the West was interested in what was happening. Uh, the Westerners have been reading basically the literature coming from the Samis that they knew the names of people like Sakharov and others. They never created the feeling that nobody is interested and the Iron Curtain is forever. I do believe even if they're going to be a type of Iron Curtain now, it's very important the Russians to know that uh, Russia has choices. And we are looking. Um, I mean, uh, I just want to, to raise awareness uh, on an article that you wrote, uh, I think it was something like two weeks ago in the Financial Times. The West cannot turn its back on ordinary Russians. It would be a historic mistake to assume that autocracy is destiny in Moscow. So this is kind of uh, referring uh, on quite a bit what you just uh, mentioned. It's easy for Bulgarian to say it than for Pol or the Baltic. <laughs> No, no, but I'm saying geography and history matters. And listen, for some of the people, talk to some of the Ukrainian refugees here, and they're not ready to listen to this, and I understand perfectly well why. But at the same time, I do believe that this is what, even from political, from strategic point of view, it's very important. You cannot see Russia is done in the way you cannot see China is done, and oh, I don't know, everybody is done. At this point, I would like to also raise uh, awareness and the possibility to ask questions. And there is a mic uh, going around, so everybody at home or in, in their offices might be able to hear your question. If you just raise your hand, uh, I would like to open uh, the, the question and answer session uh, now, if there are any questions from the floor. In the first row, please. Yes, it works. For those who don't know me, my name is Steven Dushek, and I'm a Viennese-born European. Uh, regarding Europe, Mr. Kastev, uh, my main question is because you mentioned there is no commander for a European army. Uh, what proposals do you have to find a command for a European army? That means, what do we do in this situation especially? The only chance, in my opinion, to get Europe united, to get a European command of a European army. Thank you. 
you know, specific. probably uh, better will be ready to become the commander in chief. But uh, uh, at this moment, uh, the idea is to probably try to push some of the national armies that exist to be ready much more to act together and to do things. And you can see part of it starting to happen. You're going to see German troops in the Baltic republics. You're going to see others. Because in a certain way, the army is not simply to create a command, but it's a common strategic culture. And this takes time. It's uh, this 5,000 people who are going to start with this and special force. Common procurement. Problem. And then, of course, the industrial complex. Yes. Uh, the biggest problem is that even now, when the Germans says that they're going to start very strongly investing into their defense, the first thing that they're going to do is to buy American weapons. Because probably you don't know that, unlike Ukraine, Germany does not have a single drone. Because uh, they managed to convince themselves that it is unethical to use drones. By the way, a very valid moral argument. The only problem is that if the other side do not share your morality, uh, you have a problems. So from this point of view, this is a cultural change. And in a certain way, European army is not simply an institutional decision. It is a cultural change. Uh, you can see uh, the Ukrainian men being ready to fight and to die and to have all these volunteers and going and asking uh, Kalashnikov to stay with their houses. Listen, this e the war is not simply about having a professional army there when it comes to your own defense. When you basically send an expedition corps <laughs> working here and there, it's different. But otherwise, to what extent we are ready to defend our own societies I in arms? I just saw in a survey in Austria, I think, 80% or only 20% of the people in Austria are ready to defend our own country. Which is really amazing. I mean, uh, okay, maybe not, um, not a high number in Austria, but it's, you know, this is a, this is a way this, this neutrality daily well, lullaby. Uh, being <laughs> being <laughs> somebody doing this for us. But let's uh, be the foreigner to defend the Austrians. <laughs> uh, this is because you feel very secure. Yeah, yes. it's because of uh, geography. This is, yeah, because it's of you feel very by. secure. But basically, if you see that really <coughs> somebody is going to come and destroy your house and uh, your way of life, people are doing very different things. Probably when you have been asking Ukrainians yes. five or six years ago, are you really ready to fight a much more superior military force with no prospect? Even Americans were sure that the Russians are going to take Kiev in four weeks. And you're doing this. So there is a momentum. Uh, well, I think we are not uh, 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 safe because of our neutrality, but because we're surrounded by NATO countries. But the thing is, you know, I think the European army, the question was who is in, in the command then? And I think that's a very crucial question. France would answer it differently to Germany, I'm sure of this. But the point is, let's take the steps towards this. And if you have now also a discussion about raising the budget for military uh, expenses in Austria, we say, okay, fine, let's do it, but never make the mis mistake to, to believe that it is possible with only 1.6 uh, billion more to really be have a <laughs> defensive situation as it is like, for example, Switzerland doing this. I mean, I do not know how much, maybe, um, Friedhelm, you know how much money we would really uh, need to invest in our military forces to be capable of defending ourselves uh, um, and our neutral status. So what we say is now use this momentum to build up a c European, uh, like, uh, uh, not only yeah. battle groups, but procurement. Like, let's do this together. And there are a lot of steps to be taken. And of course, it's a long way. There's a, a huge distance between the capacity of Europe at the moment without NATO and the capacity of NATO. And, and maybe just to, to give also another example, today in the Financial Times, there was a very big piece on Finland. And 30% uh, of the... Uh, adult population there uh, is uh, uh, counting to the reserve. So they have a very strong tradition in making um, uh, making the own defense capacities uh, broadly, uh, you, m you mentioned it's a cultural thing, broadly uh, uh, committed within uh, the whole population and not rather make it a uh, 5,000 troops, uh, army somewhere else, but make it a common uh, goal to be safe through own de defense capacities. But on this side, for example, uh, being uh, a foreigner in the country during the pandemic, the Austrian army did a very good job during the pandemic. 
and, and, and no, no, and this is not uh, uh, from this yeah. point of view. Listen, this is also not things to be underestimated because the resilience comes with different story. Finland was totally shaped by the Soviet Finnish War of 1939, yes. 1940. They have a 13. Hundred kilometers border with Russia. So from this point of view, they know very well, and this is also what Ukraine uh, demonstrated. And by the way, this is also what Taiwan is very much discussing today. Nobody is going to defend you if you're not going to defend yourself. Sure. You should fight first and then expect others to come. But if basically, if Ukrainians have just waiting, yeah. uh, the reaction was going to be totally different. We are going to be shocked, but we are going to be shocked in a different way. Mm -hmm. It was their resistance, basically their readiness to sacrifice that changed European public opinion. So from this point of view, just to expect that Americans are going to come is totally unrealistic even for countries that are NATO members. You should be ready to fight. And I do believe this is the difference. The Poles know it very well. Baltics know it very well. If you see on the level of the cybersecurity, Estonia is probably one of the most effective uh, European country. They are probably better than France, and we talk about real defense. So, mm. it, yeah, P simply Austrian uh, neutrality has a different status. It was much more guaranteed by the nature of the Cold War, where both sides have an interest in neutral Austria in the way it is. But otherwise, neutral states are one of the states with the highest military budgets. It's true for Switzerland, it's true for Sweden, it's true for Finland. Peter, you wanted to, to, to raise a question? No. No. I, I just would uh, add uh, your question about the uh, European commanded army. I think this is, for the time being, is not possible because an army needs a chain of command and not in the daily political task that the army has to do. It is in, in the moment of a crisis. And the EU is not in the state that you have a fast decision-making procedure. In all the political fields, we have the 27 countries and so on and so on. But what we should do, and what is, I think, one experience of, of the, of the Ukraine case, the first point is, and I think we didn't take the lesson from Crimea. Crimea, the catastrophe of Crimea, uh, is that the Ukrainian army at that time was not able and not willing to defend. So the risk for the, for the Russian army was just yeah. nothing. So they could do it with the, the famous green men. <laughs> uh, the they, they just took over. And I think what, what the, the, the lesson we have to learn is, first, we need military capacities, capacities that are ready to fight. And this is the big problem, of course, because uh, army and to defend and to fight is a national item. And so to, to come to the moment that we, are, that we are ready to defend our European Orders. This is the point we have to, ca to, uh, to come uh, through. And I think this is uh, also for a so-called neutral country, by the way. So we have to, to, to prepare our military capacities that they are, that they are theoretically and in practical terms they are ready uh, and, uh, to, 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 to fight together. And uh, this is uh, the term is the interoperability. It is not the problem that we have a chain of command, but, the, but that the, 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 the right. 27 armies are... Different kind of fuel, for example, which is really a problem. Yeah, th there are many, many practical issues, uh, but, uh, but th that, we, that th they are in a, in a, in a state that they are, uh, that they are uh, able to, to cooperate and to fight. And this is a, a long way, by the way. It's not so, so, so easy to do, but this is our task. And coming to the Austrian situation, our military capacities have not to, to be planned to defend our borders. This is ridiculous, because any attack on our, on our territory is, bef before it is a case for, for, for NATO, a uh, mm -hmm. case for, for, for the EU. 
So we can't see this is so ridiculous, the whole story. We, we cannot wait and say, we are a neutral country. And we are wait, aha, uh -huh, the enemy is coming. We wait and we are neutral. We are, do not al allow them to overfly our, our territory. And there are no transports to through our, through our <laughs> country. We are waiting, we are neutral. And then, we, and then at the border, if the, the fighting starts to be uh, at our border, then, then the others should help us. It is yeah. so ridiculous, the whole story. So I'm really convinced that we have to, to do the best that with the common sector and defense policy that we develop. This and also Austria. There is no reason uh, that we do anything different from this. This is, I think, a very clear message we should do. Last sentence. It is so ridiculous. This is neutralitätsfonds. Yeah. <laughs> it is, it yeah, is but incredible. that's politicians looking at polls. I mean, the numbers for in favor of neutrality they went up after the invasion of uh, of uh, Putin in Ukraine. So there is now everything is named after neutrality. Now it's the neutrality fund to finance the the, uh, the army. I mean, yeah. it's ridiculous, of course. Yeah. But it's like being populistic. Yeah. Nothing new but in Austria. This is just, this is in 1915, yeah. uh, Bulgaria was talking about well-armed neutrality. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. this is exactly what Pamela René Wagner said on, on Sunday. Uh, uh, a wehrhafte Neutralität. Well, there is something in, but in the of course, in but in this would cost so much. My argument is, if you if you would take this serious and not in a common security and defense policy in Europe, if you would take it se uh, serious, only Austria stand alone, it will cost so much. It's not affordable. And it is. We, there is no situation that become in this. In this, uh, in, in this defense situation. Mm. This is not possible because before we have a war between NATO and whoever, and perhaps in the future uh, the common foreign and security policy is... is, is, uh, is but for example, have. cyber attacks. I mean, they can happen, of course. And yeah. we should be prepared for that. And yeah, we should it's not a case of neutrality, not at all. Yeah, if you're attacked, it's, it's never a case for neutrality, that's right. <laughs> Terrorism is the same. There is uh, the norms of neutrality uh, do yeah. not work in this in this uh, in this uh, situations of, of cyber and terrorism. Again, from outside and not knowing Austrian debate at all, the most important thing is the moment you declare that you are neutral in the old sense, you are losing influence within the European Union. Because other discussing major security issues, and you are saying I am not part of this conversation. Yes, of uh, course. And from this point of view, I don't believe that Austria should basically behave as if uh, this is going to be the new military tiger of Europe. Uh, but in a certain way, to try uh, uh, to try to be part of a bigger security conversation has made a lot of sense. Because, for example, one of the things that makes, for example, Baltic Republics and Poland quite influential in these current debates is exactly the fact that they're taking it seriously. They said, we have a security uh, uh, threat, we want to be taken seriously. And when I was talking uh, to the German government, they said that one of the reasons Scholz decided so quickly to respond was also cables that were coming from East Europeans. There was the fear that basically Central and East European countries are really blaming Germany for not allowing arming and things like this. And this is going to hurt the influence of Germany in the regions which normally Germany is quite influential. So from this point of view, staying out of the conversation, this is the famous uh, East European uh, phrase, but when you are not at the table, you're on the menu. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is a question in here. <laughs> Okay, uh, I know it's a question which is very hard to answer, but how do you see the way out of this situation? Uh, I know that uh, on one hand side, Europe is not able to sacrifice the gas imports, and this is pretty understandable, but we are funding this war, let's face it. And on the other hand side, uh, also, even if Putin disappears tomorrow, uh, Russia is not going to change. I fully agree with you. And uh, the next leader can be another FSB agent, so... Well, yeah, the situation will not dramatically change, I believe. So how do you see that uh, we can end up uh, this? Because the more it takes, uh, the more we are suffering uh, economically and not only. Do you see a way out? 
one of the things is basically to end the war, but on what cost only Ukrainians can decide. Because honestly speaking, uh, when you say that the war should uh, end up now, and when people say that and Ukraine should give this and this and this, it's very easy to give things which you don't belong to you. Uh, uh, so from this point of view, I do believe in these negotiations, uh, it's very much about uh, Ukraine. They're going to be, and I understand very much uh, the emotion coming from President Zelensky and others talking about Ukraine being betrayed and so on. On this, unlike Hungary in 1956, which also should be fair, Biden very early on made it clear that Americans are not going to be involved militarily. And, and in my view, this was fair. Uh, uh, it was fair because basically, you know, and this also what makes the Ukrainian kind of a sacrifice so valuable because they knew that basically the Americans are not going to interfere in military terms because of a simple fact that uh, Russia is a nuclear power. And to ignore this, and because this is part of our problem. In the first sentence of any conversation, we're saying that Putin is crazy. And the second we said, why you were not intervening? If you believe that he's crazy and if you know that he's nuclear, this is a restraint. This is a restraint. So from this point of view, the economic uh, weapon becomes the one that is there. Uh, under certain conditions, uh, uh, we can stop gas, Russians can stop gas. Because the story with being asked to be paid in rubles is also a big uh, kind of a risk taking on their side. Uh, and uh, then it's going to look how this is a chicken game because you escalate in order to de-escalate. Obviously, on the Russian side, the things on the ground militarily does not know it go exactly in the way they want. There was today being announced in Turkey that Russia is a goodwill, is going to withdraw some of their troops that are concentrated around Kiev, which means that they're going to move much more in occupying territory in Donbass than trying to encircle Kiev. So it's going to be many things. And talking about post-Putin Russia, listen, the story is that we don't know how it's going to look like. None of us. This is the truth. It could be worse. It could be better. It could be disintegration of what Gary is talking about. But in a certain way, it's very different. And we should be open, and we should be curious, and we should try to follow. Uh, but otherwise, when you say that basically Russia is reproducing itself, there is a very famous old Soviet joke, which I cannot not share, because uh, at the end of the day, I do believe that foreign policy is reduced to jokes normally. Uh, and the joke is about a woman that has been living, working for decades in a factory somewhere in Ural that was producing uh, samovars, the famous tea maker. And because she wanted to save some money, for all these years she was always trying to get the elements for the samovar in order to make a samovar for herself. But any time she assembled the elements, it was always a Kalashnikov that comes up. <laughs> uh, 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 and from a certain point of view, I do believe that, uh, unfortunately, this is the thing that uh, also President Putin is making the Europeans believe is that nevertheless how you reassemble kind of the Russian state, the chance to see a Kalashnikov is much more likely than a samovar. Mm. But I think there are some assumptions we can take here. As you s said, is either, either like we have to be prepared that the gas uh, does not flow. Um, either it is uh, stopped uh, on Russian side or maybe because of an escalation there is, a, there is a, an, an embargo. Maybe not, but we have to be prepared anyhow. So this is one point really. I think that it is necessary to put in the short term as much pressure as possible economically on Putin and Russia. This is why I am slightly in favor of a gas embargo, I must say. I'm not the majority in of my party, but um, I, would, I would do this. I think there is this would be wise for two or three months, we can afford this. Um, I think it's wise not to play the chicken game all the way, like really to have red lines, not getting involved militarily or something like that. Because on the other side, Russia, and uh, there were some notions by Putin himself or by Lavrov, they estimate everything as an aggressive act. Like also the economic sanctions, uh, they said this is like a involvement in this war. So it's a very, we should, I mean, of course, we play the chicken game in a way, but we should at least try not to do it at the full extent. And there is, as uh, Ivan Kastev said, it's uh, depending on um, what Ukraine will agree on. And uh, for 
as I said before, there's a very strong narrative. Zelensky managed to build up a very, very strong narrative. This is, can also be a problem when it comes to the negotiations, because he has to come up with something in the negotiations. So I think what also the West, Europe, and maybe the US, but especially Europe, should do now is to stress towards Russia that even if there is now withdrawal of troops from Kiev, and even if they go to the negotiation table, and even if there is will be agreement of some sort, we will be prepared to keep up the sanctions as long as it is, as it is not guaranteed uh, for any security for Ukraine, because this is this is really crucial. What Europe cannot afford, even more not afford than to make a gas and oil embargo, is to have a sort of frozen conflict uh, over decades. This is even more costly for Europe, and we should do everything now to 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 try to hinder that. I very much want to agree, because when we talk about neutrality, and people now say that Ukraine simply should agree to neutrality, and I do believe that they should agree to of not being NATO member, but don't forget, Ukraine was a neutral country. Yes. Uh, and this was the Budapest Memorandum of 1994. In 1994, this was the third biggest nuclear power in the world. Uh, and they accepted without real guarantees, so nobody can push them to do anything if they're going to be an effective guarantees from outside, that they're not going to go in the same river for the second time. So this is, uh, I very much agree. Russians wanted in the beginning of this crisis to talk about new undivided uh, security order. It's not a bad beginning, but it starts with Ukraine. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Because out of all the players, this is the most insecure of them, neither being a nuclear power, not being member of a military alliance, not being member of the EU. And then, of course, what neutrality means, for sure, no NATO. What about EU? Are Russians going basically to view also Ukraine joining EU as breaking neutrality? So this is going to be negotiations, not about the territory of Ukraine. They're really going to be a negotiations for the next European order. And from this point of view, it's uh, very much agree that you're absolutely right. This is, we should be much more strategic than normally we are. There was a, a final question. Uh, there is one microphone already there. Peter Wintersteiger. Um, I have a question. What uh, scenarios would you see if um, Putin reaches, maybe in the foreseeable future, his biological lifespan end? Uh, maybe in case of a more successful Stauffenberg, or maybe I mean, in the media sometimes uh, there's talk about in intelligence information that within the FSB people are not very happy with his actual performance. Uh, what scenarios would you see then in Russia? Because I think at the moment there is hardly any success uh, visible of his quotation mark qualities, quota quotation mark closed. <laughs> and would you see then chaos in Russia, maybe even civil war, or would you think that oligarchs would, would um, come to an agreement that they promote one of them, uh, uh, all uh, oligarchs becoming warlords? <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Uh, I would like to, given uh, the, the time uh, has already uh, of, of, uh, been fast forwarding, and there has been also a question here in the first row, um, maybe to add that to a small round of questions uh, at, the, at the end. My name is Anton Fink, I'll make it short. One observation, I'd like to hear your comment. Mr. Lavrov and Mr. Putin are, as we know, notorious liars. And there is an outrage if, Pu if uh, Biden calls Putin a butcher or says he should be not in power, but no one, there is no moral outrage if these guys keep on lying. Um, the question I have is uh, related to the European strategy. You said we should have a strategy. Uh, what kind of strategy should we have now? So, yeah, thank you very much. First, the possibilities. Listen, uh, uh, as I told you, I could be wrong. I don't believe that I have an understanding what exactly is going on there. There are three factors which are risky, in my view, for the Russian leadership if we talk abstractly. One is if he decides to blame the army for what is happening now. Because, of course, the army has their own problems, but the major miscalculation was not on the level of military strategy. 
it was not the army that decided that the Russians and Ukrainians are the same people. So if he's going to blame the army for everything going on, I do believe this is the most organized force in the Russian society. And secondly, on the oligarchs, I'm very skeptical because in a certain way, there is no oligarchs now living in Russia that fits the term because oligarchs means also autonomous source of power. These are highly paid civil servants which are allowed to control the natural resources of the country. They're very rich, but this does not make an oligarch immediately. Uh, and thirdly, uh, one thing should change for any of groups to try to decide to contest the power of President Putin, and this is the feeling that society does not trust him anymore. It does not mean that society should be against the war or that society should be pro-Western, but there is a moment in which people asking questions, does he know what he's doing? And I do believe this is the question that President Putin really should fear. Asking the question, is he in his mind? Why are we doing all this? And it's interesting to see to what extent this question is going to come. It's not easy because of the control of the media. It's not easy because of the many things. Uh, but also talking about the media, I have been visiting Russia hundreds of times. People can easily be manipulated about things that they don't have a personal experience with. But for example, it's very difficult to manipulate people about the price of bread <laughs> in the shop. So as many people in Russia used to say, the major struggle in Russia is between the television and uh, the refrigerator. So from this point of view, all the sanctions are based on the idea that the party of refrigerator mm -hmm. at some point is going to prevail. And then when it comes to uh, uh, also the lying and uh, the butcher, interestingly, uh, one of the things that the Americans managed uh, to achieve in the months prior to the war was basically responding to the Russian policy of deceptions that they knew from the Crimean crisis with uh, aggressive exposure and declassifying of the intelligence information. This, I do believe, was what the new head of the CIA, uh, Bill Burns, was doing. As you remember, basically, he was almost telling us every day what also American president know. As a result of it, he deprived Russia of two things, surprise, but secondly, narrative. Because normally the idea was that there should be some accident that is going to be used as a justification. And when the previous days Americans said there's going to be an accident that they want to use as justification, this accident cannot happen. And when you say uh, what kind of a strategy, in my view, there are two strategies. One is a long term, and basically you're trying to weaken the capacity of the Russian state to do what they want to do. And this goes through economic sanctions. You're doing this not to change the mind of the Russian government, but basically to very much affect their capabilities. The second is, in my view, biggest strategy that we are uh, thinking, and this is to try to imagine if Putin is not there anymore, not knowing who is going to be. And by the way, if you want to kill somebody, tell that he is the successor. <laughs> Uh, and then try to imagine with what kind of policies we also can be a factor in shaping the Russia's behavior in the future. This is what I mean a long-term strategy. Otherwise, now the strategy is support the Ukrainians, allow them basically to resist effectively, uh, make it clear what you will do and what you will not do. Don't, for example, create the illusions that uh, basically there are going to be NATO forces coming and uh, enforcing them, but give them the weapons that they want. Uh, and then try to be sure that what we're going to have is not simply a ceasefire, but a kind of a slightly more stable peace settlement, because having the South North Korean type of a solutions mm. of a basically frozen conflict on a territory which is bigger than the territory of France, in my view, is, I agree very much, is not what Europe is going to be benefiting from. Well, then. Um, thank you for uh, that outlook, even though it uh, might be dire. I have seen one final question there in the, in the end. If we just hand over the microphone for the final question. Thank you. Hello, I'm an artist. I come from the same country, like Mr. Krastev. Um And my question is, uh, what do you think about the sanctions against uh, artists and the Russian culture? Because it's a very different, uh, it's a very, um, it's really heavy to ignore the great 
culture, the, 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 the singers, the artists, the composers, and people who are acting and who, who live in Austria and feel European, uh, European so, so do I. And uh, how we can uh, manage this problem? I want to change uh, the tema <laughs> <laughs> from war, army, for uh, humanistic uh, mm. label. So it's very important to hear what do you think about. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, for me, this is also a very important issue because the power to make a distinctions, in my view, is a difference between good policy and bad policy. Uh, uh, we have a very close family friend who is probably one of the fam famous theater critics. She was one of the intendant of the Vienna Theater Festival, so three hours after the war uh, started Marina Davidova. Basically, she initiated a petition against the war. And there was pressure on him. At some point, she basically had to leave. She left and she said, when I was in a country, basically I was treating as if being part of the Ukrainian resistance. When I left the country, I was treated like somebody with the Russian passport. Uh, this should, in my view, is simply wrong. It's wrong on a moral issue. It's also very much wrong on political issues. On the other side, there are people who not simply made their career by supporting President Putin, but they decided to stay with him during this war. For example, Mr. Gergiev, who is a very gifted conductor, is like this. This is also his personal choice. By the way, he was rewarded now. He's going to be the director both of Bolshoi Theater and Marininsky Theater. So yeah. this, is, this is choices. But in my view, all these people should be judged on their individual choices. And this is why when people are telling me that they will stop to teach uh, Dostoevsky here and there, I found this simply not serious. Uh, because I cannot, if, if somebody who is now living in Kiev and he is bombarded and he's telling me that I cannot listen to the Russian language anymore, I don't want to read Russian literature, I will have a respect for this opinion. Nevertheless, I disagree because you know what you're talking about. But when people here sitting in their apartments are starting to be very radical towards people whom they don't know, this I found wrong. Uh, and uh, this is for me very important. If we cannot make a distinction, we are basically doing what President Putin wants mm. us to do, to create the impression that this is war not against him, but a war against Russian. everything Russian, Russian culture and so on. So this is my view. Yes. Y you argued it from a moral point of view. I would also argue it from a strategic point Absolutely. of view. Like, for example, to stop the dialogue between universities, European universities and Russia. I mean, that's th the worst thing you can do. You have people there, they're open-minded, they're well-educated, they're surely not in favor of Vladimir Putin, and you stop the dialogue. This is just foolish, just foolish. I understand that when, when you say, like, let's stop the big... Uh, uh, sports events where you can profit, where Russia will gain a lot of money out of it. Okay, that's another thing. But keeping um, cultural um, and uh, um, academic dialogue open is crucial, I think. And I think we can all agree on that. Uh, talking with each other about the subject, talking with, with each other about strategies, ways forward, ways together uh, forward, is maybe the most important thing you can do. And that is irrelevant irrelevant of the origin uh, that is written in your passport and that's maybe the most important distinction between the more liberal west and uh, the more authoritarian nativist choices that we see from vladimir putin and in this regard i would very much like you also to invite to talk with us debate with us uh, all the further um, uh, views also from from ivan krastev going forward we have prepared uh, 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 food and drinks uh, in the back, and uh, I want to uh, say thank you both, uh, Ivan Kastev and Beate Manuel Reisinger, for your inputs, and thank you for uh, your time talking about Putin's war on the liberal order. Thank you so much. Thank you.